50% of every photo is lighting. The other 50% is composition. And so you can take a bad food photo anywhere. You can take a good food photo anywhere, which is, which is the beauty of it all. Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Hentje, and on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry, and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Private Chef Podcast. I'm your host, Hannes Hentje, and today we have a very special guest, mm. Melissa Santel, a talented food photographer, author, and founder of Food X Real. In this episode, Melissa will share her resources and tips for taking pictures of food that makes it look as good as it tastes. Melissa is a native New Yorker who loves food, marketing, entrepreneurship. She worked as a director of marketing at Newman's Kitchen, or Neumann's Kitchen, maybe from a German perspective, and gained experience working at the marketing posse where she helped clients such as PepsiCo and Impossible Foods develop their social media presence. It's a delight to have you here with us, Melissa. Thank you for coming today. I am honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. You did all the hard work to get here first. You know, now it's our honor to have you. <laughs> Thank you. It's all about the journey, you know? Yeah, 100%. So where did your journey with food or food photography start? What came first, photography or the love for food? Oh, definitely the love for food. You know, I grew up in a big Italian family. And so we often spent time, if we weren't spending time eating together, there was a problem. Like <laughs> we spent a lot of time eating together. It was like how we celebrated, how we loved, how we, it was really our love language. Um, and so you know, from a very young age, I spent a ton of time in the kitchen, of course, and making like pasta vazul with my mother is like one of my fondest memories. Learning how to make baked ziti and Sunday sauce and lasagna and all the Italian American classics, of course. Um, and so I, I really quickly figured out that food was part of my story. And, you know, when people ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was six, I would say, I want to be a food critic and I want to be a food writer. I want to write for Bon Appetit magazine. <laughs> um, and so I would say, you know, food, I've always stayed very close to food and food has always stayed close to my interests um, as I continued to grow. And photography and creativity itself has always also been like the cornerstone of my interests and just passions. Um, I really love capturing moments and, you know, moments that you can have and hold on to. It's like so different. You're capturing a memory. It's the coolest concept of all time. Um, but I would say that I really knew that I wanted to do this for myself and just step into my own business with Food X Feels. Um, after I had spent a considerable amount of time in, in New York City, I was working for Newman's Kitchen, which is a luxury catering and events company in Manhattan. And I was the director of marketing, but I was spending half of my time in our traditional office. And then we had a huge commissary kitchen down the street on the next block. And there was tons of chefs constantly making, making new menus, doing recipe development, experimenting with food. And it was then that I really was like, this is all clicking for me. This is where I want to be. I want to be in this atmosphere. <laughs> I want to be around these types of people who think this way. So, um, Here we are today. I'm a food photographer now. I've been working for myself for five plus years and I love it. I'm really glad I chose this path. That's nice. And there's something about uh, being able to work for yourself. No, you get to uh, deny or work with whoever you want, you know, and, and you kind of get to do it on your schedule to some degree. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, there is, there is a very challenging part. To it. It's like stepping into it, you know, out of your regular salary into like, whoa, wait, now I need to hustle for myself. Yeah. You know, there's something to be said about having full accountability for every penny that you make. It's scary. It's so scary at first, you know, you step into it and it's this big unknown world that you've never been 
never experienced, you know, you've never been part of. And then when, when you find your rhythm and find really like what you want to be known for. And, you know, for me, like when I first started food X feels, I was focusing on social media management because that's what I had done kind of coming out of my past agency life with working with food and beverage accounts. And then of course, living in New York and working for Newman's kitchen, as I mentioned, you know, social media felt like a safe spot for me to transition Um, into working for myself because of course it's like the low hanging fruit. Everyone knows that they need it, but no one wants to do the work to do it because it is so hard. Um, it does take a lot of time and energy, but over the years I've really been able to hone in and refine what I actually want to do, which is not social media. So I no longer take social media clients, but I'm still offering the creative side of that, which is all of the food photography that they need for content for social. So, you know, entrepreneurship, it's just like, it's truly all about like learning and moving and evolving. And the best part about it is that I feel like the possibilities are endless. You can just keep going and going. And I think one of the fun parts for me was like realizing years into my journey that some of the most random things that I might have learned completely unrelated over here in something completely different field suddenly apply at what they're those things I'm like wait I, I think I can put this together in my head you know and then it makes sense maybe for a client or for a service that I'm providing or something and that that's kind of the interesting thing about entrepreneurship because it's 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 not in a box you know and and I think especially in a city like mm-hmm. New York uh, you kind of to some degree get to design your own service, the package you want to provide, just like you said, okay, you, you came from your safe space, social media, but evolved, you grew out of it and decided for yourself that you want to focus on photography and kind of Mm. building brands, consulting people on how they can uh, be more intentional around their branding. And, And I think that's, that's, that's the beauty. And in a city like New York, it's, it's it's just so possible because yes you're obviously always catering to clients and the market but at the same time the market is so big that you get to work with people that you want to work with exactly exactly and when i was living in new york i so i was really only working for newman's kitchen at the time and i would say it was like the most it formed me and shaped my perspective on food and the possibilities around food more than anything I've ever done in my life. And so it was just like, you know, walk you step out of your tiny apartment and you're in this sea of, of strangers, but also the coolest concepts. Everyone is kind of just like coexisting, living their own dream, like exercising their own creativity. I mean, it's on the side of buildings in the form of art and graffiti and murals. It's, it's everywhere you look. And so I think also having been exposed to that much stimulation and inspiration also just, it plays a a really huge role in inspiring you to want to, to innovate and create something, design your own packages, understand what people truly need and how you can best contribute yeah. to those needs. Yeah. So uh, how did you go about finding your first photography clients that, you know, how, what was that progress like for you to, to actually step into food photography full time? So I would say back in the day when I started Food X Feels, that's when social media was the gateway drug to working with other people, right? Like I said, like everybody needed it. It was just something that was top of mind. Um, and so during that time, before I left my corporate job, I made sure that I had one social media client that I knew would cover the cost of my rent and my base expenses. And so I was able to transition then comfortably semi-comfortably, let's be honest, (laughs) knowing that I had something to fall back on and and rely on. Um, And so from there, I would say, you know, what I did was I was very intentional and strategic about who I wanted to work with. I had a huge list of dream clients at the time I was in Tampa when I started the company in Tampa, Florida. So I listed all of the restaurants in Tampa that I wanted to 
work with that would be like my like golden nuggets in the sky. I was like, okay, this is, these are like my star clients. And then I really began building a community around, I began building a community on my social media and my Instagram page and starting conversations around what I thought was really valuable in the food space from photography, from branding, from a strategic standpoint, you know, how to really help your brand stand out in saturated markets, you know, like, like hospitality and culinary space. And so I think as a way of infusing my personality with my skill set, I was really able to attract the clients that I wanted to have. Um, but the transition from doing social media and blog writing and kind of like influencer work to full-time photographer did not happen overnight. Certainly it was, it was a big process and a lot of saying no to things that would have been lucrative, but saying no to things that didn't contribute to the end goal. That's a tough part, right? Because that's like, you have to, you have to spend the time contemplating on where do I really want to move? And, and I think Warren Buffett actually talks about it. He's like, write down the top 25 things that you would like to do and then take the bottom, I think, 22, mark them and make sure you never, ever do any of them. <laughs> you know? Because otherwise <laughs> you're getting distracted or you go for something that's lucrative and, and you, you lose the main goal that you're focusing on. And, it, and it's, it, you're a lot more likely to do it with something that's either lucrative or something that's also very appealing potentially. You know? so, and, and I like the way mm -hmm. he put it. It's like you have to... Keep, keep a certain focus. I think having a clear vision and having the clarity, which usually means that we are intentional and we sat down first and really honed in, maybe have some intuitive line of thought into, hey, this is where we want to go. And, and, and I think it's very good that you had that clarity and focus. Yeah, I think I have to attribute that also to working at the, in a marketing agency environment where You know, we oftentimes took clients through exercises that were helping them define their vision, mission, and values, and also just helping them understand the framework of their brand and how they wanted to show up in the world. So I very much took those learnings and infused them into FoodX Feels when I was starting my company. So from a strategic standpoint, top down, I feel like I was definitely at um, an advantage probably more so than the average entrepreneur, because I was like, okay, I know how to identify what my vision is. Um, I know how to I set up email campaigns. I know how to do the outreach. Um, and so, yeah, it was a huge learning and don't get me wrong. I'm still learning all the time, which I'm grateful for. It keeps things interesting. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we stop learning, we're dead. Like the, the nature of life is such that we can learn something every day. Exactly. And I know that you know this all too well, having had multiple companies yourself. Um, what would you say has been your biggest learning along the way? My biggest learning is, I think, honestly, I didn't, I think it comes down to having a positive attitude and being able to see the good things in, in, in whatever has happened, because, you know, I had, uh, bad partnerships in between, which taught me a lot about the kind of human beings I want to work with. And now I trust mm -hmm. that a lot more than I used to, because just like you said, you know, sometimes, um, maybe something that looks very lucrative comes across the table. Uh, but mm -hmm. again, uh, maybe I spent too much time with Warren Buffett, but not with him, but with his content <laughs> rather. <laughs> But, you know, he says you can't make a good deal or a good business with bad people. And I think that that's also mm -hmm. a lesson that I, I really learned is like, if something feels off, most likely it's, it's right, you know, and, um, there's, there's, you, you just can't no met, there's no contract to keep a crook accountable. You know, it just doesn't exist. If somebody wants to screw you, they'll find a way. Uh, so I think that was a big learning lesson for me that um, just do business with people that align with your values, you know, um, just do co collaborations with people that you resonate with 
um, because it it mm -hmm. it gives a stronger foundation. Not to say that something can't go wrong, even when that is in check, but the foundation is so much more stronger, and it allows you to focus on what's important, rather than sitting there feeling into your gut, wondering if this is right or wrong. If they do what they said they were gonna do, you know, you can sit there and focus on hey, how can we make the best work possible together? You know, how can we focus on on things uh, where we want to move the needle rather than uh, speaking to lawyers too much or speaking just simply sitting there worrying about the the foundation of the relationship in the first place i think that was a very very crucial lesson that was rather painful to learn because uh, i'd say that a business partnership that goes south is probably not that i've been through a divorce but it might i think it might be worse than a divorce Because it's it's very challenging and it's it's not it's not fun. So <laughs> I think I, I, I hopefully never right. have to go through any of that. Yes, I would not wish that upon anyone. But you're so right. Trusting your gut and your intuition is such a huge part of it. You know, I think when I first started my business, I had a, a client that I was potentially work of courting them. They were courting me. I was courting them. We went back and forth and back and forth and several iterations of proposals and even doing like a little bit of free work because, you know, at the beginning of a consultant consultancy or like creative studio, sometimes the best way to get work is to do a little bit of free work. You show them what you do. And I think a lot of new photographers do that as well, especially in the restaurant space. They'll contact an executive chef or a restaurant owner and they'll say, Hey, I would love to shoot a couple of dishes on your new menu. I'm happy to do it like on my own time for free. Um, and just so that you can get an introduction, a formal introduction to me and my work. And so I had done, I had done something like that in the beginning of food X feels. And it was very much like I realized really quickly that it can put you in a pattern that you don't want to be in as far as like people's perception of you, you know, like now I would never as, <laughs> as an experienced photographer, as an experienced entrepreneur, I would never do any free work. I really just, I don't, it's like against my religion now. I don't know. Um, but what you do in the beginning of every relationship really helps frame people's perspectives of you and you're training them how you should be seen by them. And so I think like those first interactions that you have with a new client or a new business partner, or even on a personal level, a new friend, it really helps define and set the tone for how your relationship will be and how they'll treat you moving forward. Yeah. So that's definitely, I feel like that's one of the lessons I've learned too. Yeah, that's true. I think even on a family basis, my, my, my family still thinks I have to cook every meal because I'm the chef. <laughs> <laughs> How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes it's a bit annoying, to be honest. I'm like, you know, I'm also just a guest here. <laughs> But I also right. like to eat good food. So sometimes it might be better that I'm cooking. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I actually, it's funny that you say that because... I just had a conversation with my family after Christmas because sometimes I feel like I show up to holidays and they're like, here's this, here's this, here's this, Melissa, <laughs> make magic. And I just look at them and I'm like, but this is in my house. Like, I'm, I'm a guest. <laughs> I know what I I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not hosting. Like, fine, I'll put together the charcuterie plate. That's fine. But I don't want to be like, making Fra Diablo for seven hours on Christmas Eve, like someone else, someone yeah. else do it. Yeah. That's, so. that's how that sometimes really? goes. And I walk in the door, I'm a guest in my parents' house and, and my mom starts priming me on the ingredients she has in the fridge. And I'm like, wait, mm -hmm. like what? I, I didn't sign up for this today. Like, <laughs> Yes. I mean, I will say I would rather be on cooking duty than dish duty. So at <laughs> least I can like pass that off to someone else. Yeah. My, my my brother keeps complaining that when when I used to do these really elaborate family meals where I would have like five, six courses and, and like really go out of the way for a day. And he's like, every time when he did that, then I had to clean up everything while he was sitting at the table enjoying it. And I was like, well, he, he was eating with us. But then afterwards, when I got kind of... Uh, 
got got all the positive feedback and everything. I was just sitting with swirling wine. He, he was in the kitchen cleaning. <laughs> so he hated it. <laughs> and you're like, this is the trade-off, sweet brother. This is the trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> I cooked, you clean. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I have to say this is kind of your fault because it sounds like you spoiled them and now your family is really, they're never going to let you go. Well, I, 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 I didn't know, you know, at first I wanted to share what I learned when I was working. That was like the first couple of Michelin star restaurants I learned that and my skill set was really getting a lot better. And just, I was just a lot better cook or chef at that point um, than I was before. So I just wanted to share that with them because uh, some of my friends have never dined in those kind of restaurants in their life. So I could bring an experience to them. Right. Uh, and, and and I think, yeah, my my family just adopted to that. And they were like, yeah, okay, you can keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't blame them. I think I would probably, <laughs> I would volunteer to be your sous chef. But yes, <laughs> I, I would also be like, keep, keep the Michelin star dinners coming to the family. Thank you. <laughs> uh, did you ever do any pop-ups with any other chefs? Um, actually, no. I was asked uh, to be involved in a couple of pop-ups in New York. But it um, never really too much. It wasn't never really part of the pop up scene. Mm. Actually, one I did. Yeah, I did uh, one with a, a friend of mine, and it was like a group of three of us. One was kind of hosting the service part of it, and and it was Chef Rene and me who did the. Um, that was like two days. That was fun, but I also felt like it. It was a lot of work. Like it was. There's a lot of work for yeah. what it was at the end of the day. And um, so I wasn't too crazy about it. <laughs> so there's a one and done for you. Yeah, I think for now. Let's see. Let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm open um, to things when, when I, maybe in, in Florida, it's easier to pull it off than in New York. Like I always think there's an yeah. ex extra layer of uh, just New York friction. You know, whether it's uh, transportation mm. or, you know, you, 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 I give you an example. One time I was, I was doing an event and I tried to uh, get eyes from a restaurant a friend and I just pulled up the car in front of the restaurant. I wasn't parked for not even 90 seconds and I came out and I had like a $90 ticket. And I'm like, really, like, this is how the day starts. I just wanted to get a bucket of ice, you know. <laughs> And those are those New York friction moments where we're like, ah, it's such a grind. It It is. It does not let you get away. It's like, oh, you're sleeping? Wake up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it's funny. I, I was helping a client develop a brand in New York City. They're actually based in Brooklyn. Um, and they're a catering events company as well. They're called Kalon. And part of their business model is trying to basically activate themselves in their new brand in the community was they were doing collaborative dinners with chefs. And so they were tapping on a bunch of local chefs in Brooklyn and Manhattan and et cetera, all the places. And they were doing private pop-up dinners. And I just, it reminded me, I'm reminded of them because you were talking about you're cooking for your family and friends and they're getting a really cool, intimate, private experience. And I think there's just so many ways for people to bond in those experiences and yeah. those moments. And you're really creating a memory for them, which is cool. There, there is one guy and I don't have his name top of my mind right now. He did something cool in the beginning of COVID. Um, he started renting luxury apartments and bringing in chef, guest chefs and had like very intimate experiences where people could dine in like a penthouse somewhere with an amazing view that they could never have and um just just wine and dine for a night in a very different setup and and i think this probably at a time where restaurants might have been closed to some degree <laughs> so i'm not not so sure how uh how legal the, the whole thing was but it was a great experience for whoever was part of it that's for sure <laughs> Yeah, I'm jealous. I wish I was part of it. I was in Tampa during the pandemic and it was weird to see the contrast between Florida and then the rest of the world because Florida was like Open for the wild, wild west. Yeah. Like, yeah, we were kind of just still operating and still doing things when other people were like not leaving the house and only ordering groceries. And of course, like 
I won't even rehash the nightmare that was COVID, but yeah, it's not good there. for us, <laughs> you know, yeah, we were, we never, it was, a, I feel like we had a totally different experience because we kind of shut down, but we didn't. And so, yeah, we were just misbehaving over here. <laughs> In true Florida fashion. Yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, if, if you're working with a chef in terms of, for example, um, branding and photography, what are some of the things that they're usually struggling with where, where you can help them, where you can uh, give them some guidance? And what are some of the tools or tips that you would give them on their way to become more brand Aware. So usually I'm working with chefs at a couple different points in their like career life cycle, we'll say. Um, the first being if a chef is starting a new concept, then they would come to me and say, hi, I'm having trouble communicating what I want the concept to be, what we stand for. Help me figure out what the voice and tonality is of our brand. Help me figure out what it looks like. Um, and at that point they're really in like the deep brand development stage where they've built out the culinary concept and they're experimenting with menu items and they've gotten, they've gotten like the overall idea, um, sorted out in their head, but they need help bring it to life visually. And so part of what I would do in that scenario is say, let's go through a brand identity workshop. We'll define your vision, mission, values. We'll understand what your tonality is. We'll go through exercises like a um, competitive framework exercise where essentially we'll conduct a competitive analysis between you and other chefs or concepts that are similar to yours in the immediate market. So we can make sure that what you're crafting is totally different than what your competitor is offering from an experiential standpoint, from a culinary standpoint, and then of course, just visually. Um, so I would say like that's kind of the first scenario. And then from there, we would help them form a brand by pulling in a designer and having a designer create a logo for them. We'll provide creative assets for them, iconography, those all those visual goodies. Um, and then as a follow up to that, we would do a photo shoot. So if they're in their space, it would help them understand how they can really bring that brand to life through using props and styling and We usually go through the kitchen together and we pick out like, what glassware are we using? What cocktail are we pairing with this item? Uh, we build out a shot list. We do like a deep creative discovery call to identify what the plan for the day is. If we are doing a, a one day shoot or a two day shoot um, and then any other elements we would need to bring in to bring the vision to life. So sometimes that's bringing in models. Um, helping them understand what type of attire and style they need to be wearing in order to reflect the brand personality. Um, so things like wardrobe, hair, even down to nail color, we get really specific. Sometimes we have the models paint their nails or go get a manicure done one of the brand colors of the brand. So it's really helping them hone in their vision in a super strategic, detailed way. And then of course we would execute the photo shoot and then the coming out of that, they would have a fresh gallery of photos to use across all of their marketing channels, social media, email marketing, website, etc. Yep. And I think this is so important. And at the same time, since, since we're speaking to, to private chefs to is, um, to realize that e every chef, whether they want it or they know it, or they don't know it, they have a brand. They have a name, mm -hmm. they have food images that are somewhat attached to who they are in the space. And, and I think it's very good, the exercise that you just kind of described for an entire restaurant also applies to a private chef. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's so important that we know how we present ourselves, uh, how mm -hmm. we want to communicate to the world, our potential clients, the agents. And I think everything you mm -hmm. said, obviously, we don't have our own space. We don't have maybe our own blades and things that, that are part of it. But overall, the, the mental aspect, the framework of everything you mentioned still applies. And, and, I, and I think it's uh, so interesting to, to approach that a little bit more consciously 
having a framework like what you do with chefs because I think it really sets people apart just like it sets restaurants apart and and uh, everything oh, that definitely. you mentioned you know obviously makes a big difference in brand awareness or uh, it's it's also so important to to have the right communication that whatever the owner of a place wants to translate actually arrives in the public and being intentional about that. Certainly. Yeah. And I would say it is absolutely just as important, if not more important for someone in the private chef space, because the reality is we're living in a world now where social media is our visual reputa reputation. It's a representation of who you are um, as a professional and as a human in general. And oftentimes before you're getting hired for a job, whether it's with a client that you're doing private chef work with, or if you decide to get back into the restaurant space, people are looking at your social media channels and they're looking at them very in depth. Um, and they're looking for, they're looking for numerous things, but you have the ability to stand out in the market against all of your competitors. If you are showing up and you're showing up consistently and you have a really cohesive visual and voice. And so for me, when I'm working with people who are developing personal brands, um, so in this case, we'll say you're a private chef developing a personal brand, we would help identify like, who are you? How do you show up in the marketplace? What types of strategies can you activate specific to social media or email marketing, or even in the way that you're communicating and doing outreach to potential clients that we that is uniquely you that you're immediately setting yourself apart from the other private chefs that might be competing for the same job that you are um and a lot of that is high level strategy and that's something that i love working with people to execute because it's just like the you already have the answers right I'm just helping you unearth what those answers are and putting them on paper so that you can then communicate them freely and openly and confidently. Yeah. So it's so important. It really is. But don't say just because the just part and, and that's, that's, I think also the beauty, you know, you found something that comes natural to you or at this degree, you're so involved with it that you, you, you say just, but you're actually solving <laughs> something for people that can be extremely painful for them because they're sitting there mm. and they're hammering their heads on the wall and they don't get that congruency and alignment. They, they don't know how to translate the message or how, put it in the framework. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. that's where someone like yourself comes in extremely helpful. And, and I wouldn't downplay that in a way because it's a crucial piece, not only to a brand, but in life to, to kind of get, get that structured, storyline for ourselves and, and get clarity. I think it all boils down to getting clarity on how we want to communicate and put ourselves out to clients and the world at the end of the day. Definitely. Thank you for catching me on that. I think it's easy to say just or minimalize things that you're doing when you're just in such a rhythm with, you know, like at this point, I love this work and I live it every day. So to me, it's, it's like, Oh, well, of course, this, of course you have a vision, mission, value. Of course you have this social media strategy or marketing strategy, but yeah, it's, it's easy for, to forget because I'm so close to it that people, not everyone has this. And of course, like I'm very honored and it's not lost on me that I have the opportunity to help people every day with this work. And that's what keeps me showing up. So I'm yeah. thankful for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that's, um, I, I guess that's what it feels like to never have to work another day in your life to some degree. You know, you're doing something that you love. <laughs> I don't know if we would go that far. <laughs> okay, it was worth a shot. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> Not yet, getting close. Um, so yes. looking at another important piece to the puzzle, photography. And that's, that's certainly something that's so important for chefs, you know, Food just mm. is, it's a visual first, like you, you can talk about it. And I, I've, I've met some people who really know how to, to translate it in words. I'm not one of them. So I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> happy that I can take pictures these days and I'm not 200 years back when that wasn't a possibility. Um, but yes. 
<laughs> most people struggle to take great pictures and then they have average pictures or bad pictures of great food um maybe you you can share a couple of do's and don'ts with people where they when they are building their portfolio um get get a, get a good glimpse on you know what 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 their food can really look like and it it doesn't suffer the pain of a bad image well i would say 50 percent of every photo is lighting the other 50 percent is composition and so you can take a bad food photo anywhere you could take a good food photo anywhere which is like which is the beauty of it all right and that now we have cell phones in our pockets as well that we they just give us the opportunity to snap anything that we're doing at any given time but also when it comes to food photography i you know there's a reason why the annoying influencers sorry sorry to call them annoying but the influencers will go into a restaurant and they will request a window seat and it's because the lighting is the best by the window and they're just they want to create the best content while they're on site in a restaurant space and so i would say making sure that you have really great access to soft light which is not direct sunlight direct sunlight is going to give you a total different look and feel and harsh look of the food and it actually can take details out of your photo so you want to avoid direct light but having a soft light source is really important it illuminates all of those nice highlights and shadows in the dish that you're creating and then i think another huge part is understanding perspective and so for example if you're shooting something that has height it is you're not going to want to shoot it overhead, right? Because you're you're missing out on the depth and really like the personality of this amazing thing that you made. Maybe you made like the world's best cheeseburger and there's pimento cheese on it and bacon that's from like the best place in the world with the best pig that's ever been, you know, it's ever been grown. Um, and so you would want to make sure that you have your burger here and your camera right in front of it because you want to get that head on so that you can highlight all of those amazing elements that are inside of the burger. So really taking into consideration perspective, angles, and lighting, those are the keys. Yeah, I was actually very surprised how challenging it was to take a great picture of burgers. It was when, when, when we started shooting our food, I was like, This damn burger is one of the hardest things to get the proper picture of. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. And trust me, in a professional photography setting, when you have a macro lens, it's it's a little easier because the camera is like, obviously, it's 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 um, it's magnifying your shot. Right. And so. I have an 80 millimeter lens that I do not go anywhere without. It's one of my favorite lenses, especially when I'm in a restaurant setting. And so it's just, it's looking for all those beautiful details and it's capturing them immediately. But I would say like styling also comes into play um, when you're talking about something with a burger because paying attention to like how the cheese has melted and if there's a drip on one area of the burger, twisting it to make sure that you're getting its best camera, camera ready face. Like you're getting the beauty shot, we say. Um, and don't be afraid to move things around. Obviously chefs work with their hands and you're moving and styling things all the time. Like that's your happy place. Um, but styling is huge when it comes to photos because it's easy to miss those little details if they're covered by a piece of arugula or, you know, if microgreens are on top of this like amazing hamachi crudo that you made. It's like, you gotta move them a little to the left so you get the right proportion microgreens to fish so it's like being really considerate um of those little details and i know as as a chef you are you live in the space of details details are are everything you guys focus on but um the camera often sees things differently than we do and so just being mindful of how to really capture those moments yeah And it, it's it's a learning curve, I'll admit. The first couple uh, photo shoots that I was a part of, I was like very, very surprised. And, and I think people people don't appreciate photographers. 
until they went through that pain themselves. Like it's, uh, people think anybody can take a camera and click a couple of good pictures, but once, once you go through the learning curve, what it takes, um, you know, it's, it's a profession. And at the end of the day, it's not easy to just click amazing, outstanding pictures. And there's, no. there's a lot that goes into that. And yeah. And not only on the front side and, you know, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of prep work that goes into the photography process that you're working with the chef and the manager and, you know, other people, maybe on the restaurant marketing team for me, I'm, there's a lot of upfront prep work and then thought process around how we're going to shoot each item that we've outlined in the shot list. But then the other side of that is editing and editing is so huge and just like a restaurant or a private chef has a brand, every photographer has their own style and brand. And a lot of times that's communicated in how we shoot stylistically. And then also just as important, how we edit. So editing is like the whole other side. That's like, I would say that's like the voice of a photographer, um, really how we're choosing to bring each image to life is through editing as well. Yeah. So part of the toolkit. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for sharing all of those tools, tricks. And I know you've also prepared something for the audience. Uh, you know, she actually has a slide f prepared for all of you that gives you the big do's and don'ts, or maybe you describe um, actually what, what you got on there. And uh, we will make sure to add a link to the show notes where you can all download it straight from her beautiful well thank you so much for having me i'm excited to continue going through on the other side of this this mini food photography course we've put together yes this is going to be fun uh, so stay tuned uh, melissa and we are working on a little course for everybody and thank you so much for taking the time out today thank you it was great chatting with you thank you for joining us at the private chef podcast If you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level, make sure to share this podcast with them. And if you enjoyed this episode, click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.